All right, welcome everyone to the keynote address uh, for the Women in the Economy workshop. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Shivan Anderson, and I don't want to make it a very long uh, introduction. Shivan has a great history of working on topics related to women and gender. Uh, she has a lot of very important work. I'll just highlight a couple of my favorite uh, papers, which really helped me to change a lot of my thinking about the roles of women. One of the papers uh, I like Shivan uh, of Shivan's extensive CV is the paper on why dowry payments have not declined uh, and in fact increased in countries like India. Uh, and despite the sort of phenomenon of missing women, and that was a very nice theoretical analysis taking into account not just supply and demand, but also the way society is structured, in particular the role uh, of caste. And so that was a very nice theoretical contribution. And then Shivan's other paper, which I really like, is on missing women, a very important empirical contribution, where uh, in her paper with Debra Jare, they showed that the phenom phenomenon of missing women is not just at birth and not just at early ages, but in fact, widespread across the age distribution. So it forces us to rethink uh, what we think we know about the causes of the missing women phenomenon. Uh, so with that very brief introduction, I want to leave more, as much time for Q&A as possible. I will let Shivan tell us about the legacy of female landlords in India. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sakshmi. And it's very wonderful to have you as a moderator because this is directly related to much of your own research in the past. Um, so this is joint work with Vipasha Maiti at Ashoka. I'm, I'm not sure if she's here, but um, so it's very motivated by sort of the more macro uh, focus to development, which is sort of asking, you know, why are rich countries, some countries rich and some countries poor and really sort of zeroing in. I think the consensus in the literature really sort of brought about by Assembly Robinson um, is the importance of institutions and well functioning, inclusive sort of historical political institutions are absolutely central. And uh, in that work, and this is where Lakshmi has crucially contributed for the for the context of India, is sort of the historical importance of uh, property rights and the role the landed elite play in that uh, political economy framework. Um, so just more, and this is sort of a, uh, interest I have more generally is sort of just trying to understand like, well, if this is so crucial, then it must be true that if, you know, we sort of always are interested in this question of how development can promote uh, female empowerment sort of quite broadly. And then it, if this is the case, then it must be crucial, the possibly crucial, the direct role women play in these sort of historical political institutions. So this is one, this is the work I was doing with Pasha, sort of trying to focus in on the Indian context. And I also have other work uh, where we're looking at in the African context, sort of uh, whether ethnic groups traditionally allowed women in sort of in, in positions of power. So in this, so in general, there's very little research trying to uh, showing the persistent effect between women's positions in historical political institutions and outcomes today. So this is what this paper is attempting to do. So we're going to be using a measure of what we're going to argue is a proxy for female property rights, and you can think of it as re relative political power, and showing how it seems to systematically uh, significantly influence several dimensions of female empowerment today. So just the two broad literatures it's, it fits into is the one uh, aiming to focus on sort of more gender focused historical persistence. So this is I would say the sort of uh, growing literature on just looking at bias sex ratios. Um, so this has been identified well by and one of the first papers was looking at the Australian convicts into the convicts sent to Australia, which is a very male bias sex ratio since then. And, and there's been other work in, in developed countries looking at wars. And so, of course, wars a bias to sex ratio the other way in favor of women because they because so many men die in these wars. There's recent work. These are both uh, uh, very recent work, one using the Triple Alliance war in the in Paraguay and the Rwandan genocide. And what, what those papers show, and all of these papers show, is that uh, what you see, tend to see, is low marriage rates. So if you see a, fe a historically female by a sex ratio, you can see persistent low marriage rates today, high female labor force visitation, and also positive cultural attitudes towards women working. And then the second thing I think is trying to, this work that was sort of uh, 
started by uh, Alessina um, and Nunn and, and Paola was the long run historical effects of division of labor towards women. So if you see these crops that are fair, and there's interesting work done for the Indian context by Karazana, uh, you see these persistent effects of these crops that are favor female labor. And in turn, you see the persistence of high female labor force position today and also positive attitudes towards women working. So this is sort of the persistence angle and then directly related to the another literature that Bipash, or sorry, Lakshmi has um, contributed to significantly again is just uh, female political participation today. And we have a lot of evidence from India because of, you know, the very uh, proactive uh, reservations for women. And there we see there's a lot of been a lot of research, you know, done at the state district village government level, where we show, I mean, this audience is well familiar with positive effects of education, child health. You know, we see that the gender affects the allocation of public good expenditure and also, um, you know, fe female entrepreneurship is a recent work. And then also things like female political aspirations and less uh, female biased gender stereotypes is also a, a possibility. So this really is sort of just this paper sort of fits in between these these two literatures. So just to get to the measure we're going to be using. So we're using the historical census of India. And uh, in that they have these occupation tables and in one occupation occupation is a rent receiver. So this is an individual who um, who who do not cultivate their own land, but sublet sublet their land for rent. So we're going to consider only individuals for whom rent receiving is their primary occupation. And in these historical census, we have this de disaggregated by gender and district, and this is what we're going to use. So we're going to think about creating a variable meant to represent relative exposure to female rent receivers uh, who are calling landlords. Um, and it's going to be a relative measure to men. And we're thinking of this is to some kind of proxy of uh, a measure of property rights in any way. And, um, in another way, we think it's picking up some sort of rel historical persistence of relative political power. So the focus, what I'm going to show you today is really just going to be this female rent receivers in a district divided by the male rent receivers. Um, we're going to add following sort of none the way he thought about for the slave trade paper. We're just going to aggregate this up for each districts across the census years we have. Um, and then we just match the historical districts to the current districts. We could all, we also consider a uh, uh, proportion female rent receivers to total rent receivers, but I'm not going to show you those results today. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of the variation we have in the data. Um, so just to point out, it's 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 not very the lowest category is the orange, and it's and that goes from zero to twenty. And you can see that that you know we get quite a bit of variation, and we get quite high numbers. Um, and uh, unlike uh, Lakshmi's earlier work, we're going to focus on all of India. So we're not going to just be sticking to colonial India. So we have this variable for the princely states as well. Um, well, Lakshmi also looked at that for another paper. But this is, uh, we're going to be calling it uh, all of India. And what we'll see is that we don't actually, see, I mean, this is a little bit hard to to read this map, but I mean, the, the, the orange ones are the princely states, but this is just to show you that we're not going to see a systematic correlation with this between colonialism or not. And I'll show you that in other tables. Um, and this is just if we were to do the rent female to total rent receivers, we also see this significant variation. Um, so just why do we see this variation? Well, I mean, I think probably people in the audience are more familiar with this history than I am, but there are very, there are celebrated female zamindars in Indian history, right? So they're typically uh, from a zamindar family themselves, and they are married into another zamindar family, and they are widowed at a relatively young age. And they subsequently manage their husband's estates. And most of them are very well, the wealthy ones are known for, you know, charitable donations towards temples, or they founded schools and hospitals. Um, so for example, uh, these are sort of household names, Rani Babani, I'll probably mispronounce these, was a household name in terms of philanthropy, but then others were famous for actually their political role in challenging the British even, right? So Rani, Rashmoni, clashes with the British in India became household tales. Uh, Rani Lakshmi Shima, Shamibai, leading figure in the Indian Rebellion in 1857 against East Indian Company. And Nawab Faz Sunesa was, was awarded the title of Nawab by Queen Victoria and the first female Nawab in South Asia. So there's, there is this sort of, and, I, and this is always interesting in the African context too, there's many examples of these very powerful women in history 
So you wonder, if, you wonder sort of what is the legacy of this? Um, and the, the census acknowledges these women in this rent receiver role. So this is a quote from the Hyderabad census of 1911. And they say, you know, agriculture was always recognized as a noble occupation and the proudest of Brahmin or Said had no objection to, no objection to his females appearing as cultivators. Um, so for example, these females of certain castes appear in the capacity of rent receivers, a fact which shows that women in these castes are accorded larger rights of property and all they imply in respect to their position in the home and in the family. And in fact, the government of, uh, sorry, the British East India Company at one point tried to intervene. They weren't comfortable with these widows left with young sons owning property, and they wanted the sons to come under the company's stewardship and ready until uh, ready to control the property themselves. And there were official discussions of this in you know 1776 that recommended the disqualification of these females amandars from the position of, of, of management. So for, for example, and for, there was a plan that came up for Bengal, it was called the Court of Wards, establishing care of state if incumbents were minors, idiots, or females. So um, company would appoint managers of a state, plan was never implemented, it was defeated in the Calcutta, Cons Calcutta Council, but still every female examiner came under scrutiny by the company, but they were in the end left to manage these properties. So what you see in, during the colonial period, where of course we see high mortality, as many as a third of men might die without a surviving son. So these widows typically managed the property if there were no sons or until the sons were old enough. So and what we're going to see in the data is this is the main key historical variation that explains our variation is going to be the relative rate of widowhood. Um, so I'm going to show you, so I'll just get into the best, the specification, and then I'll show you uh, what, you know, a bit of some exclusion restrictions tables and then uh, the outcomes. So this is going to be our main, our, our first specification. So we're taking outcomes, and this could be at the individual district, state, and year, depending on the data we're using. Beta is, is measuring our key coefficient of interest. So this is our female to male relative uh, rent receiver by district variable. Then we'll be having other uh, historical controls at the district level, present day controls at the district level. Um, well, I didn't leave this in, but possibly individual controls, depending on the data set we're using, state fixed effects, time fixed effects, again, depending on the data. And then our standard errors will be clustered at the district or state level, depending on, uh, again, the outcome level, the level of the outcome variable. But then to be a bit more precise about identifying this, we're also going to compare contiguous uh, neighboring pairs of districts. So we're going to take two districts that are adjacent to each other, but they differ in this measure of female to male uh, rent receiver. And um, how we define that difference, of course, varies. We, we try many specifications, but what I'll show you today is mainly we're taking two districts where the difference is above the median difference, okay? or the boarding districts are themselves above and below the median value. Um, this provides us with the largest sample, but we've all, we also uh, do many different ways to pair in these. So essentially we're restricting the comparison to just two districts uh, that differ in this measure. Um, and then, uh, so we, you know, the specification is the same, but we've got a contiguous district pair fixed effect in this. But again, beta captures our key variable coefficient of interest, and we have the same set of controls. And then whether we put in, our results are a bit, but in generally they're robust, but if we put in a state fixed effect, we're, we're restricting those contingent districts to be within the state, a present day state, or we, if we don't put the state fixed effects, we're allowing cross, uh, uh, and sometimes, and but it's generally, you know, people, they could be in different states today, which don't necessarily correspond to the historical provinces. So we use many data sources for this. So mainly our historical data is coming from the census of India. We try and control for very, uh, a lot of geographic uh, climatic soil controls to sort of think about agricultural productivity. So we're relying on what we can historically for that, or uh, so the district reports from the agricultural contingency plan, also ICRASAT, agroecological agri maps uh, of India and so forth. And for our outcome variables, we again rely on the census or the national sample surveys, the national family health surveys, the election commission of India and, and ACLED, which I'll talk about while we look at that, which is a conflict data source. So just to show you what, you know, we wonder what this variation is coming from. It's really, as I, as I pointed out, it's coming from this historical widowhood rates are really determining this variation. So you have high mortality rates, 
Uh, well, because mortality is higher for men than for women, and because men marry younger women, higher mortality rates are necessarily going to generate greater relative female widow to male widows. So what and you do see this correlation. So this is the one variable that is determining our variation that we have found significantly. So how we're going to think about is, you know, this is possibly a confounding factor, but I'm going to really be showing you that this our key var variable is positively related to development outcomes, if anything. So if we worry about this persistence of high mortality, um, you would imagine that should bias our estimates downwards. So that's sort of our argument of, of how we're sort of going to still treat this as, as uh, exogenous variation. So this is showing you um, how, why, how the, this is, so this is using the historical data of widows versus widowers. And we see that positively significantly determines our key variable of interest. Um, we put in, you know, just another relative ratio. So this is female to male married, and we don't see that significantly determining. And how we vary across these columns. So in all specifications, we're doing all our, our geographic sort of climactic agricultural uh, variables and historical care uh, controls. So the only thing that varies across different specifications is whether you put in state fixed effect, which is current day state fixed effects, or province fixed effects, which is the historical uh, province. Um, anyway, this is the basic positive correlation. Um, and then this is doing the contiguous district estimations. We see the same results. So the first three were, were I'm showing you the ones where we're comparing the, the pairs that are below and above the medium and the last set of uh, three columns are the differences between the borders when they the difference is greater than 50th percentile. But again, we see this positive significant relationship between uh, the widows and widowers, relative uh, widow, right? You can think of it. And then this is just an exclusion restriction table to show you that we can't, we don't find a significant core with any of these other sort of variables. And I just gave you an example, a uh, subsample here. We can put in all the environmental sort of climactic controls. We don't see any significant variation. So these, so this is a regression on our key variable. So this is the estimated coefficient of our key variable, the relative rate of female to male rent receivers on say whether it was British rule, the proportion of landlord exactly comes from uh, Lakshmi's previous work with Abhijit. Um, this is the proportion of Brahmin in the historical census, the proportion of Muslim, the historical sex ratio, the proportion of rice, knowing the rice versus wheat uh, differences for men and women. And then these are sort of geographic. This is a sample of the geographic, but we could put in many. There's no significant difference, okay? So this is sort of a version of an exclusion uh, restriction table. Okay, so now getting to the outcomes. So I'm first gonna show you a set of what uh, the pro sort of women outcomes that have been focused in on the literature on sort of uh, historical persistence of a sort of a pro female um, outcome. So this will be education. So. This is uh, years of education. This is coming from the National Sample Survey, um, and so this is this is how our this is the OLS regressions. So we're putting in uh, the geo controls, history controls, the individual controls. For example, include caste, religion, age, whether they reside in a rural or urban area, and then just whether we include state fixed effects or not. So this is years of education for women, years of education for men, and then this is sort of a robustness check, just looking at literacy rates. So in general, we see our variable significantly and positively determining education. Um, and this is the OLS specification. And then this is the contiguous districts estimation. And we find the same thing. So this is just zeroing in on the years of education. Um, and this varies, these two, these different columns vary again by our, which uh, specification I'm using. So whether it's the boarding districts above or below the median and the difference of the boarding districts is greater than 50%. So a significant and positive relationship again. And this is now things like child health outcomes, and we focus in on, uh, on uh, mortality. So this is, typically, this is coming from the National Family Health Survey. So we have a uh, first column is neonatal mortality, which is the child dies before 28 days, infant mortality, the child dies before one year, or child mortality dies before five years. Um, and then I, the next set of columns break it up by gender. And we see a strong negative and significant relationship between our uh, historical variable and uh, more ch child mortality. Um, so then, uh, then, then this is the contiguous estimations where we see uh, very similar findings. Um, 
And again, these outcomes are consistent with the sort of literature on uh, current day, you know, political a role of, of women in politics. So they've also found relationships between education and uh, child health. And this is now fertility. So this is coming from the National Family Health Survey as well. So the first uh, variable is total children. Um, so this is just the children, total children women have had. Uh, this is the what they propose. They respond as the ideal number of children, and then whether they prefer the next child to be a boy. So a, a measure of gender bias preferences. Um, and what we see is a negative relationship on fertility, both in terms of fertility and ideal fertility, and then uh, a negative and significant relationship on on sort of a gender preference. And then this is the, the robustness check of the contiguous estimations, again, a negative and significant relationship between uh, fertility outcomes and our key variable. So then we turn to the female uh, autonomy indicators. So this is uh, again from the National Family Health Survey. So this is, I mean, every, people in this audience are very familiar with these variables, but um, you know, whether the respondent makes decisions for obtaining her own, her own health care, whether she makes decisions in household purchases or decisions in visiting or staying with uh, parents and siblings. And um, this is the OLS specification, you know, varying by whether we include state fixed effects or not. But essentially, we see a positive and significant relationship between our historical variable and female autonomy outcomes today. And then this is the this is an alternative measure of autonomy. So this is a, mobil a mobility measure. So this is uh, a positive, uh, takes on a positive value of one if the respondent does not need permission from the husband to go to the market in these two columns. And this is whether uh, she needs permission to uh, visit a relative or a friend. So essentially these are again measure, uh, a positive relationship between our historical measure and a autonomy measure in terms of mobility. So she has more mobility uh, in these, uh, in these districts where there was historical presence of female landlords. And then this is again the contiguous uh, specification showing the robust uh, relationship in general. Um, there's one exception here, but in terms of the autonomy measures, and then this is the mobility measures. Then finally, we look, so just for gender focused outcomes, our final thing is uh, intimate partner violence outcomes. So again, the National Family Health Survey is a good source for this. The first one is just whether uh, women deem uh, IPV justified. So these are meant to be you know, a set of gender norms that uh, women feel she deserves to be beat by her husband if she transgresses these gender norms. So one being uh, she is unfaithful to her husband or whether she disrespects her husband, um, or sorry, in, fa in fact, this one in for the Indian context is just re disrespect in-laws. Um, and we see, so women say, you know, report that they feel less likely that it's justified to be beaten by their husband if they were to be unfaithful, or if a wife, it sort of is put more objective, uh, subjectively than that. If a wife were to be unfaithful, we see a negative relationship between our historical measure and whether they think IPV is justified or not in these in these contexts. And then a second way, a second uh, situation is whether the wife goes out uh, without telling the husband. So again, a negative. So she feels less it's less justified to be beat in our our historical la female landlord areas. And also whether they they've actually been beaten by their husband. So this is actual experience of IPV. And again, we find a significantly negative relationship between the, the experience of IPV and um, the historical variable. And then uh, this is again, just reconfirming these relationships we find in the OLS regressions with the contiguous estimations. So this is the IPV justification if she's unfaithful or disrespects, again, negatively correlated. Um, and then this is the second set with whether she justifies in the context of the wife goes out or if she's actually been beaten. So this is sort of the set of, of pro-women outcomes that we, we find uh, you know, significantly 
positively related to our measure of what we're thinking of as historical relative female kind of political power or at least property rights. Um, so now we sort of think, well, what is the main mechanism for this? And we sort of think um, it's sort of a political legacy story. Um, and partly, uh, anyway, this is what we're sort of exploring. Okay, so we first, so, our, so now I'm going to show you a set of political outcomes that we relate this to. So the first uh, will be just again from Lakshmi's earlier work, which was looking at whether states implemented uh, the, you know, as we as we all are very familiar with the 1993 amendment, you know, reserved a third of seats um, for women and, and Lakshmi is using the district level variation in this earlier paper. Um, and uh, the variation across states, uh, whether to us to when women were granted this political represent representation. So in this case, we're just showing you a correlation. So we aggregate up our variable um, uh, at the district level up to the state level. And we're just correlating it with whether that was a state that had late reservations for women relative to when they were when they were first implemented. And actually, in some cases, they were implemented even before the amendment. I think uh, Kerala is one and there was one other one. And then whether and then the actual outcome, the fraction of female legislators. And then this is the fraction one close elections, which is almost like a placebo test, right? This is sort of a randomness to whether a woman is in a position or not. So we, you might you wouldn't expect it in that case, right? So what we do indeed see is so this is just the state level variations. So we're not relying on our district level or contiguous contiguous, contiguous um, empirical strategy here. But we do see this, a negative and significant relationship with whether it was a late reservation state, and we do see a positive and significant fraction uh, for the female legislators. So this could sort of explain a little bit of a historical political uh, persistence. So you know why why did some states um, adopt it, the policy before others? Could be a bit about this historical legacy of female political power. And then borrowing directly from uh, Irma Klotz uh, Frigueras work, um, we, and so we're using her data, so it's a little bit outdated now, we've got to update this, um, because for example, the Janata party, you know, doesn't exist now. But um, what we see is we see, so this is now back to a, a district level analysis, and we're doing, this is sort of across several election years, so now we've got to put an election year fixed effect as an additional control, as well as our regular controls. And what we see is this positive, kind of uh, influence on very extreme left positions. So already in general, I mean, I don't actually know so much with regards to India, but in general, women are, are more left than right, right? So this is sort of um, put forth first, even, anyway, yeah, but this is a bit like in Esther Duflo's Econometrica paper originally talking about the impact of reservations. That was sort of the model of why we might see, you know, the women being in, a, in the reserve position at all, having any impact at all, was sort of these different political extremes of what men and women might represent, right? Um, in that case, it was a poll, it was, you know, a representative model, voter model, representative candidate model, but still it was, it was, you can think about it in terms of why even putting a woman into position can matter, be, can matter because of the different, uh, uh, leaning uh, politics. So anyway, what we see is essentially this significant positive relationship between, so this is the proportion of seats uh, in a district, right, uh, that are hard left parties. So we're using the classification of, of uh, I think Irma used it in her work, but also Banerjee and Burgess in their earlier work and a few others, uh, classified the parties at the time like this. So we're, So this is an increase, significant positive increase in the hard left to the cost of the soft left, or in this case, in the Janata seats at the time, right? So this is sort of pushing it to quite extreme uh, left uh, views. And then this is whether the women, in the women, the seats were filled by women. So this is the proportion of the seats filled by women of these parties. And again, a positive and significant effect of the hard left to the cost of the soft left. Um, so sort of a, a pushing it to the more left extreme of the political spectrum. And this is just the contiguous uh, political parties, uh, sorry, contiguous estimation specifications. Um, and again, we see this uh, uh, confirms the relationship between our historical measure of female political power and the proportion of seats uh, either overall or for particularly for women in the from the hard left parties. <clears throat> 
And then finally, we want to think about sort of, well, rather than just uh, female formal political participation, how can we uh, pick up sort of more informal? Um, so we, this is where we turn to the ACLED data. So the ACLED data is typically thought of as a conflict data set, but they also have a lot of information on any civil unrest. And interestingly, they also uh, break it up by gender. So uh, what we see is we have a measure of whether women, there are demonstrations or protests featuring women in particular, so they could be comprised, so they, they sort of define these sort of gender focused demonstrations or protests. Um, and they, so they're either comprised entirely or majority around women or around women's rights. So something involving a woman's focused uh, civil unrest. So we have gem demonstrations is actually the all encompassing uh, variable and then they break it up whether define it by a protest and then in turn even if it's a peaceful protest. Um, and again, we have year fixed effects. So here we're using the look. So what you know from the ACLED data says the actual locate geolocation of each demonstration when it happened uh, exactly the date, right? So we're coding this up, aggregating this up to our districts. Um, and what we see is a positive relationship between our historical measure of female political power and whether there are the incidents of women's protests and in turn peaceful protests and demonstrations. Um, so this is the OLS specification. And I'm um, sorry, this is just between 2016 and 2019, ACLED started coding things up for India. Um, this, I mean, it's a huge database for Africa that goes back a long way, but for India, they've only started collecting data since 2016. And then this is a contiguous specification where we see the, um, a robust relationship between positive relationship between the women's invo women's involvement and in civil unrest or, or civil unrest centered around women's issues, uh, a positive and significant relationship. And then finally, we looked at political violence. So this is this has got uh, this is a, a variable that's looking at political violence targeted at women and girls. Um, and violence A versus violence B is is just the type of violence. So violence A is violence against civilians, mob violence, riot riots. Violence B is sort of looting, property destruction, strategic developments could be grenade, remote violence, explosions. And then also this is. So this could be violence from the government, the police, anything that is targeted at women, whereas this is whether a, a demonstration becomes violent and that and that so and that and so this and this all again, a demonstration that involves women, does that is that a violent one, right? And what we see is that a negative relationship. So we're seeing somehow this female political historical variable is negatively correlated with whether we see uh, violence, so a little bit consistent with the IPV results, but we don't generally necessarily see in, in other contexts a correlation between IPV and other types of violence, right? It's not always correlated, but in this case, we see a, a persistent negative effect of violence targeted towards women um, in, in different contexts, right? So whether it's just a violent contact, violence against civilians in general, or whether it's in a demonstration protest context. Um, and then we see this reconfirmed in the contiguous uh, estimation specification. So this is our, our main result. So I'm gonna actually stop and we can have some discussion. So what we seem, I feel we're finding is a persistent effect of some you know, measure of, I think of, we're, I'm hoping you sort of interpret this as a measure of sort of female relative political power. Um, we see these significant positive effects on female oriented outcomes as has been alluded to for the other you know, persistence literature and also the the more present day female women in female political positions, finding positive effects on education, child health, you know, fertility, you know, lower lower fertility and female autonomy measures and IPV experience or uh, norms around IPV. Um, but then, and but we could, you could think of so I'm sort of interpreting this as a political power. You could think of rent receivers as just a simple occupation. Um, but we don't find any effects of that. So we, I didn't show you those results because there are no, I mean, there are, there's no significant relationship between our historical variable and present day uh, female role in the labor force to the measures we had. At the same time, I think women, you know, FEMA, as most of the audience probably thinks too, maybe the female labor participation in India is a bit hard to explain. I mean, it's very, it's a huge puzzle as to why it's decreasing at this point. So it could be a bit of that. 
or it could be that this is more a political channel. I mean, certainly these female rent receivers, I mean, just like in general and related to, again, Lakshmi's work, I mean, the big landlords of India don't exist anymore, right? We had significant, there's significant land reforms. And um, so it's, it's not clear how to think about the, this persistence. So I sort of think it's more through kind of a political kind of culture or, um, and anyway, what we do see is we see there is, seems to be some role for a political legacy. We see it in the formal political representation, just to the extent, I mean, once the rent, once the quotas come in, there's, it's all random. So, but that initial quota system coming in could have been determined by it. Um, we see extreme left-leaning, you know, moving, trying, trying to move the political spectrum more left, and then sort of female-oriented civil unrest. Um, I mean, what's interesting when you look at that ACLA data, I mean, India, by relative to any other country in the world except for Pakistan, they protest all the time. I mean, they're the most protesting uh, nation in, in the data. So it'd be interest, it's interesting to think that this might have a role in uh, why women are protesting so much and, and why you see variation in that. Okay, thanks very much. I can stop sharing my screen, should I? I think. Sorry, I was hunting for my unmute stuff, so Shivan. Thank you uh, for that absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. I had not uh, seen this paper before, so I'm absolutely, and so much, so, there's so many intersections with my own work, so I'm super interesting. So I thought I would give you a few of my thoughts for a couple of minutes, and then we can uh, open the floor for more Q and A. And we, you know, we have, uh, we have almost 20 minutes, which is fantastic. So I hope we'll have a good exchange. So I really like this paper. It's, uh, um, it exploits a data source which I didn't know existed. So it's always fun to learn about uh, interesting data that exists in the past. Uh, in fact, the, the extent of, of female uh, landlordism was surprising to me to see your uh, maps that there were so many places in which there were women who were actually listed as the official rent receivers. So I was just, you know, some of the questions I had were curiosity questions, uh, which places had more of this. It was interesting, in fact, to see no correlations with things like uh, whether you were under direct British rule or land tenure or even uh, soil and climate variables. That was actually quite surprising to me. And then the uh, strong correlation with so many different measures in the present period is again quite uh, detailed. I think you've put in lots and lots of uh, uh, controls to try to rule out some obvious types of uh, mechanisms. Uh, and I was just thinking about two big questions from my point of view. One is, given your previous work as well, I was very surprised to not see the extent of missing women as one of the important outcome variables. One would imagine that that, that would be also a, a pro-woman outcome to have the women survive. So I was a bit surprised not to see it there uh, in the modern period, right? And the second thing I was wondering is, you know, I think in terms of uh, econometrics is to sort of establish how much this is quasi-random variation. The kind of thing I'm worried about is that there are these long-standing cultural factors that determine both the extent of female rent receivership and any outcomes today, whether it's education for women or their mobility or, or other outcomes. Why am I worried about this? Because we know there is a long degree of persistence in these kind of cultural variables. Uh, so in fact, I remember seeing Guillaume Casson present uh, some very interesting work on gender ratios from starting from the 1881 census. And it was amazing how persistent those were. The states and districts that have very poor gender ratios today in India also had extremely poor gender ratios in 1881. So th the worry is that, uh, think about the situation where a woman gets widowed, all right? There could be some places where the cultural norm is to let the woman have the ownership of the husband's estate and receive uh, the rents in her name, but there you can imagine other situations 
where they, uh, it's the brother of the husband who takes over as the de facto owner or the cousin or some other male relative. So the biggest worry I have is that the cultures or the local cultures that permit female land ownership de facto are also the same cultures that encourage uh, women to protest or not just, you know, I'm not saying positively encourage, it could be just don't discourage it, right? They have no opposition to women's education or women moving outside the home. And so I'm wondering how to get around this issue. Um, so I was going to suggest a couple of things which you can check. One is this idea that this was determined by random factors like who died, so widowhood. So it might be useful to see instead of collapsing 1911, 1921, 1931, all into one summary variable. But before, before you do that, you could check how much variation there is across these 10 year periods. So if it is essentially random, right, then the increase or decrease in such things should be correlated with the increase or decrease in, in widowhood. Uh, so it might be useful to show that correlation in differences rather than just in levels, uh, because you've shown us in levels, but uh, if that is the determining factor. The other thing you could do is to look at whether the historical land ownership variable is correlated with widowhood today. So we do not want any long run disease or other kinds of local climatic factors. And if you can show that in the past, these were the areas where the men were dying um, um, kind of disproportionately, but that is no longer true today. That's another version of sort of trying to get at this exclusion restriction. And the third thing I was wondering is whether you could use the uh, 1918 uh, flu pandemic as an exogenous source of excess widowhood. So in one sense, you could, if, it, if there's a, there was a way to isolate the impact of that pandemic on this, on widowhood uh, as recorded say in 1921 census, and that could potentially be an instrumental variable because it, it was, the pandemic as, as I recall, did place a heavy burden on India in terms of deaths. Uh, it was quite a severe pandemic. Uh, and you could imagine that that's uncorrelated with all sorts of local cultural pro women or otherwise factors, or at least we could make some, you know, a little more exogenity would be nice, since this was an event which was unexpected, came from outside and, and so on. So those were my uh, few thoughts, but absolutely fascinating. Um, so if you want, you could take a few moments to reply, or we could collect a whole bunch of questions and you can give a, a consolidated reply uh, at the end. Um, I'm happy either way. I could respond to you, but um, yeah, so those are excellent. I mean, I really like the uh, idea of checking the differences by year. That's very good. Uh, we'll try to do that. Yeah, I agree. It's not ideal. Um, so, I mean, I th what we first thought of, so first of all, yeah, the sex ratios are not determined by this today, but even like that other work. So I know Kassan's work shows a, a there is a historical, and that's partly driven by caste, right? So certain caste practice female infanticide earlier, and then that sort of persists as a custom. So, I mean, we have the, the first, we have the controls for the sex ratio. I mean, sorry, for, we can control for sex ratio, control for caste. And also what is true is India had, uh, I think it's four different legal sort of schools, historical schools of law. And there was a bit of very, I mean, uh, anyway, this, this has been written about, there's a, there was, uh, there were four different legal, uh, uh, schools of law that varied a little bit on the rights of widowhood, you know, ownership, property, and so forth. But all our fixed effects are subsuming all that uh, variation. So there is sort of controlling for all that. And just with regards to sex ratio, even the war, like the war papers, where they're exploiting this historical sex ratio persistence, the sex ratio after one generation fixes itself. If you lose all the, if you if you have all the deaths, it doesn't take long. So it's really, the argument is you shouldn't, you don't really see it in the sex ratios, you see it in the persistence of a cultural norm. Um, but anyway, you're sort of acknowledging that, uh, that for sure. So I think this is excellent idea to try and uh, think about a more exogenous measure of widowhood. And yeah, possibly the flu. Uh, the, the only thing about the flu is I think it equally kills men and women. So you know, ideally you'd want almost one that 
a disease that is more likely to take the lives of men. But um, yeah, that was, that's a very good idea to think about that. Thanks very much. Yep. So we'll open it up to questions. And um, Farzana is asking people to put questions in the chat uh, for Sivan. OK, I can start. Uh, so I have to to talk to simple, yeah, some simple technical question. I mean, because you're looking at so many outcomes which are potentially correlated with each other, I was wondering if you've done any of the index analysis, just you know, putting all these outcomes, creating an index, instead of looking at each one of them separately, because the concern would be that you know, you're looking at so many multiple outcomes and they're potentially uh, you know, correlated with each other, and it's just it just so happens that we find uh, some of them or many of them to turn out to be significant. Of course, that's not necessarily true here because you're really finding very consistent results. But it might be also nice to try to do this index analysis. Yeah, sure. You mean just like an overall one for the districts, like? Because you can easily aggregate up, say, the IPV ones and the autonomy yeah, ones, exactly. or something like yeah, that. That yeah, will for sure. Yeah, but yeah. you mean creating even a, like a overall female welfare index or something? Yeah, you could create separate ones for violence and separate ones, let's say, for you know health. But you could create one single one, which is creates an index for women's welfare and sort of look at what the coefficient on that is. Uh, or aggregated by health and uh, other measures of well-being, let's say, of women. Yeah, you could try that, yes. We think that would be a bit more convincing. Yeah, but uh, I, I had some of the similar concerns that uh, Lakshmi has uh, aired here, which is, again, about the persistence of the cultural factors over time, which in the first place are leading to women landlords appearing in some places and not in others. And also it's differential mortality rates probably reflected in that. So it would be really nice to have some insights into uh, some more thought or some more descriptives on what are these places, which are these places which where these women landlords show up and how they may or may not differ from other places and what they, so I think a, a little bit more background on that would be helpful. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? So there have been a couple of suggestions on the chat to also use things like uh, correcting the p-values for multiple hypothesis testing. Uh, yeah. which is along the same lines as Farzana's uh, comment, a different way of approaching the same issue, right? Yeah, that's good. So Nidia, if you want, you can unmute yourself and just talk since you say you have two questions. By the time I, I think I'm, it's faster for me to talk than type this thing because I'm using my husband's uh, laptop, but okay. So so thank you, Shimon. That was, a, that was an uh, excellent presentation. I, I just wanted a sense of how many female landlords we are talking about here and in you know you, you did show those graphs but like what, what are the numbers the summary stats of this and also do you condition on on length of tenure of of these landlords so does it matter if someone's you know a woman has been a, in in power for for a year versus uh longer and are, are those, do those those magnitudes differ along any measurable dimensions thanks yeah, sorry, we don't have that information. All we know is is what occupation people have in each census. Um, so that's what we're using. But yeah, there is significant like I, I what's the I think the average is 0. 0.4, um, the relative ratio, but uh, and then in turn, you have to figure out the relative ratio of rent receivers to laborers. Do you mean in terms of the total number of people um, in ter uh, Yeah, I, I couldn't I I don't, I can't remember that just offhand, but it's very significant. It's not at all just one or two around. It's, uh, it's very significant. Um, but yeah, I should get, I should, I don't have the numbers offhand, but I, I can get that. Yeah. That'd be another way to represent uh, the variation in the maps and things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the length of tenure, did, did you, did you say that data was not available? Is that what you meant? Yeah, no, no, okay. we simply just know the recorded occupation in the census. 
Um, yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm sort of trying to average think, thinking that, that, oh, sorry, just like average across the census, thinking they could drop out, you know, because of tenure, but um, sorry, Lakshmi, yeah. No, I was just saying census doesn't ask how long have you been in this occupation or anything close to it, so. No, yeah. Yeah, more questions? I, uh, again, I think, uh, you know, going back to the question that Lakshmi had, uh, or rather the suggestion she had about looking at uh, past uh, mortality differences by gender on present mortality or health differences. So what are the competing mechanisms here? You know, I wasn't, I didn't get a sense of that. So there's one mechanism, which is the political legacy, which, you know, you discuss. Uh, but this other competing mechanism could just be that uh, historically men, for some reason, are less healthy or there's less investments in health relative to women in these areas. And that just persists over time. So you see greater engagement of women politically. Um, you did talk about labor force participation. Uh, are there other competing mechanisms here that one should be thinking of, particularly this one, and if we could discount those? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was just feeling the health one wasn't really there, because if anything, we, we see a positive impact on child health, right? Um, and that I think this should be correlated with higher overall mortality. Um, again, we don't have mortality rates from this period, but maybe we'll look, we'll try and look into something like the pandemic. We'll see. Um, but we don't have mortality data uh, from this period. So this is sort of a conjecture that, <laughs> that the mortality is determining the, why we see this variation in the relative widowhood uh, rates. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess. Uh, whether there's any effect on the proportion of women owning land. I assume you mean women owning land today. Yeah, that's again, uh, yeah, we should do that. I think that's available now in the current, uh, yeah, we should definitely look at that. That yeah, should be that available. Thing, right? Whether the same, that itself persists. So once you're a norm is set that a woman can own land and can be a landlord, uh, and that also might be a persistent norm because you said you don't find things on labor force participation, but land ownership is a completely different uh, thing. Yeah. Kanika, do you want to unmute or can you unmute yourself and then maybe you can, if you have further, anything further to add? Yeah, I was just avoiding it because of my daughter. But uh, yeah, uh, no, I, so my questions were largely around you know, whether the effect on land ownership in agriculture and uh, and so so agriculture census gives farm decision making or women who are farming on their own land whereas the ownership of land uh, data is given by nfhs the mm -hmm. most yeah. recent nfhs uh, it has its own problems um, but ihds again gives some data on ownership for the latest round. So, uh, but agriculture census actually doesn't give ownership. It basically tells, you know, how many women are, um, are, are, are actually farming the land rather than owning them. That's also, I think, a relevant variable, right? Yes, no, you know, because, uh, yes, because in some sense, if women have, you know, if they, if they own land, they're also more likely to, in some sense, manage them. Uh, there is a very high correlation between the two variables. So yes, uh, I just thought that those two variables might be interesting to look at in this context. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Those are excellent suggestions. Yeah. I actually didn't know the agricultural census had a gender breakdown. That's very good. Well, if there are no other questions, let us thank Shivan for um, a very fascinating presentation. And uh, thank you for coming to this conference virtually. This is, let's uh, look at the bright side of this whole pandemic in this <laughs> thing that we can actually get participation of this kind when in normal times it would be harder to arrange with a lot more costs uh, involved. So thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, and thank you, Shivan. Thank you so much.